Good evening and welcome to our uh, our final public recovery town hall hosted by our Lieutenant Governor uh, Bethany Hall Long. Uh, I would ask uh, everybody, th well, thank you for jo joining us. First of all, please do visit de.gov slash economy for details about Delaware's reopening and recovery planning. And at the very bottom of the page there, you, um, you will find a form where you can also offer public feedback that we are using to inform the reopening effort. Of course, for the latest updates on coronavirus, please visit de.gov slash coronavirus. We have some pre-submitted questions that we'll get to in just a little while. Please also leave your questions in the comments, either on Facebook uh, or live stream. And we'll have some opening comments here from our from our guests. And we'll start now with uh, our Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long. Thank you, Jonathan. And I want to say good evening uh, and thanks to all of you for joining in to our final community recovery town hall, special emphasis on my area from my community, the southern portion of Newcastle County, although I'm sure we have Delawareans from across the state. I'm Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long, and I'm really pleased tonight to have with us our Director of the Division of Public Health, Dr. Carol Rattay, as well as the Director of our Delaware Division of Small Business, Damian DeStefano. Governor Carney, as you know, has announced the series of recovery town halls. Some of you have engaged with us over the past couple of weeks as we've tried to take all of your input and safely consider how to reopen Delaware's economy. Our governor has emphasized so many times, really, in order to have a healthy economy, we have to have a healthy community again. But as we look forward to the plan and tonight, we want to continue to gather your input, your thoughts, as we safely open. All of our lives have changed uh, over the past few weeks. We've had to operate totally differently and pretty much have been upended. So as we move forward and work toward creating a plan to reopen, we really need to establish that balance between our economy and keeping all Delawareans safe and healthy. So again, a new normal is going to look a little different than it did before. And again, I wanna thank all the local officials, our wonderful chambers, our stakeholders, our nonprofits who've joined us. And tonight, we wanna give a special shout out to our other statewide uh, electeds who've come on with us. We have Kathy McGinnis and Colleen Davis. I wanna thank our Senate President Pro Temp, Senator Dave McBride, our Majority Leader, Nicole Poor, our Majority Whip, Brian Townsend, as well as Senators Ennis, Hansen, Sokola, Walsh, and Sturgeon. From our House, we're pleased to be joined by our House Majority Leader, Valerie Longhurst, our Majority Whip, uh, is with us Mitchell, as well as Representative Viola, and our co-chair of the Joint and Finance Committee, Quinn Johnson, Representative Matthews, Griffith, Mitchell, Bentz, Williams, Bombach, Ozinski, Kawako, Jeff Jakes, Hensley, Ramon, and Spiegelman. Um, I apologize if I missed anyone who else signed on, and many of our local community representatives from our municipalities, as well as from our county and our row office, including our county executive's office. Everyone has really been in the front lines with our community during this pandemic. And again, I wanna give a special shout out to our first responders, as well as all of those in the health line and this being Nurses Week, um, my background as a nurse, wanna really acknowledge the nurses role that they have played. So we hope that tonight, as you listen to Delaware's economic plan for reopening, that you will kindly visit uh, de.gov forward slash economy. This is a form that can be completed that filled, you can fill out on the bottom of the site. Given we know that uh, this is not a traditional format where we can directly call on you, but we will actually be utilizing from your feedback the forms that have been pre-submitted and the questions that were pre-submitted to us. So again, we want you to know that we're listening, that we're here for you. Again, every day, it seems like we're getting updates. Our uh, governor will be coming forth, I know, tomorrow with a press conference. We've had updated executive orders. And Dr. Rate will share with you tonight some of the updates of what we've been doing in the front lines with testing and our more vulnerable spots in our state, including our hot spot in Sussex County. Also, again, as Governor Carney has indicated with the modifications, really how important it is that we follow through and do those safe distancing measures, 
wearing the face covering and the mask. We know that there has been some interim changes starting tomorrow, February, May 8th with small businesses and their specific guidelines. I know that Damien will be able to go forward with tonight and talk about. And so again, striking that balance. So again, thank you so much to all the electeds who've joined us and the many leaders in our community. Again, share with us your additional questions and your comments. They're really important to us. And so at this time, I'd like to turn this over for brief introductions for um, our guest. Uh, we'll have Dr. Carol Rite speak with us for a couple minutes, and then we'll turn it over uh, to Damien, and then we'll go right into our questions. So Dr. Rite, open to you. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Halong, and happy Nurses Week to you, you and to all the nurses in our state who are just amazing heroes in this, uh, in this crisis. Um, today was a sad milestone day for us in that we surpassed 200 deaths of Delawareans for COVID-19. And it's a, it's a stark reminder of how devastating this infection is. And the, the impact has, has been so tragic in so many ways, not only the many deaths, but many hospitalizations and the many lives that have been impacted with infection itself. And of course, we know that the, the economic impact has been devastating as well. At Public Health, you know, we have been working very hard to help protect Delawareans, but also responding to you know, a number of aspects of this crisis, like protecting people in long-term care facilities, which I'm happy to talk about, as well as um, uh, in Sussex, which is a hotspot, other vulnerable communities ac across our state. And as we move forward, um, we're, we're, we will be announcing tomorrow our testing plan, which uh, we're really pleased with how this has come together to a place where we finally have access to enough tests to, um, to do what we need to in our state. Um, and we're also um, finalizing a contact tracing plan that we look forward to sharing next week. So happy to talk about you know, different components of what we're doing. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Damien. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor. Uh, my name is Damien DeStefano. I'm the director of the Delaware Division of Small Business. And uh, I'm on tonight to answer questions folks might have about uh, the reopening of the economy, the phased approach that the governor has been talking about, the phase one and phase two. Um, we're also uh, going to be looking when the opportunity presents to do so safely, uh, to take interim steps like the ones that were announced this week. Um, and so happy to take your questions about that. And uh, just know that, that we're hearing from lots of, at the Division of Small Business, we're hearing from lots of small business owners, uh, lots of employees. We, we know uh, some of the difficulties that you're having right now and, uh, and, and are here to help you get through it. Great. Thanks so much. I guess we're to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. And uh, so we'll use the rest of the time here until 7 p.m. to take your questions. We have some pre-submitted questions here. Also, we'll take questions from the live stream and Facebook comment section. So, Damien, not surprisingly, we're going to start with you. A question from Ted Hinderer in the pre-submitted questions, a common question. When are we looking at hitting phase one? Uh, Ted said, Ted believes we need to reopen the state. Um, as a small business owner, he, uh, he's looking for a date certain when we're going to reopen. Can you just talk about that process at all and, and, what, uh, and what you're going through there at the Division of Small Business? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're uh, part of the team that's working on trying to determine that. Uh, I think uh, Governor Carney is going to be talking uh, in greater detail about that tomorrow at his press conference uh, when he lays out, uh, and Dr. Rattay talked about the testing plan. Um, but also the, the timeline for, for some of these phases. So I'd encourage you to watch then. Uh, I know a lot of business owners are, are asking about it, uh, but I think his intent tomorrow is to provide some clarity around that. Thank you, Damien. And a question for you to hear, Dr. Rattay, in the Facebook comments from Maria, who says, uh, if all this was to flatten the curve and the curve is below anticipated, um, why all this to reopen the economy? Why not just reopen the economy in full today? Can you talk about the potential public health risks of that and, and why we wouldn't uh, just open fully open the economy today? Yeah, absolutely. So 
I, you know, I think this is obvious, but let me just, you know, state we're, we're doing all this to distance ourselves from each other. Uh, right now, when there's no treatment, there's no vaccine, this is the most effective approach to decrease the spread of infection. Delawareans deserve a tremendous amount of praise for flattening the, the curve, if you will. And that's great because had we not done that, we would have um, really gone way beyond our ability from a health system perspective to, to, to manage um, all the illness and hospitalizations and, and deaths that would, would, have, would have taken place here in Delaware. We still, though, have significant numbers of infections and hospitalizations and, and deaths in our state. I mean, we, we're averaging around, you know, seven, eight deaths a day from COVID-19, which, um, you know, is um, it's a high number still. Um, I think we all know that um, we have a lot more work to do to push down uh, the infection rates even more. Um, the next phases not only include, you know, getting it contained, keep, but keeping it contained because there really is no other effective way to keep this from spreading if we don't social distance and um, take all the precautions that are, that are necessary to uh, decrease the spread of the infection. Um, when we began to roll into the phases, which I think we're all very much looking forward to, it's gonna be really important that we continue to look at our data and make sure we're, we're keeping it contained. But it's also why um, social distancing is gonna to continue to need to be important. You know, wearing face coverings is gonna to continue to need to be important. And, um, uh, you know, monitoring, um, uh, the rates of infection will be very important uh, to know if uh, if we are uh, can, if we are containing it. Thank you, Dr. Atay, and a follow up for for you in the Facebook comments here from Catherine, who says that I have a compromised immune system. Catherine's worried that she's not going to be able to go out and about until phase three. C can you can you talk about the risks to to folks with compromised immune systems and? And, uh, and why maybe there's still gonna be some restrictions uh, on folks who are more vulnerable than others? Yeah, I, I, it's stressful, I am, I am sure, um, because individuals with, um, whether it's a compromised immune system or cardiovascular disease or, or diabetes, cancer, um, are risk factors for more negative consequences of this. And in the plan that has been laid out by the White House and a plan that you know, we think makes a, a lot of reasonable sense, um, it does recommend waiting till phase three for um, vulnerable populations, people with underlying health conditions to, to go out and be exposed. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you absolutely need to stay in your home for you know, the next, the next few months and, and you can't go out, but there are going to need to be a lot of precautions that you will need to take, um, you know, making sure that you um, are keeping a distance from people as much as possible. Certainly, you know, those measures of keeping your hands clean, hand sanitizer, face coverings are going to continue to be important. Um, we will continue to lay out more guidance as we go forward, but with, with you know, absolute certainty, there are certain folks in our, in our state um, who are going to have to be much, much more careful in um, um, preventing getting infected uh, than, for example, our kids and, and young adults. Thank you again. And we might come back to you here on this next one, but I'm going to start with the Lieutenant Governor. This is from John Stroud in the comments who uh, who asked about N95 masks and if and um, he has concerns that face coverings cloth face coverings don't add as much protection Lieutenant governor can you talk about why we've asked uh, Delawareans to wear cloth face coverings rather than medical grade N95 masks sure I can and I know um, Dr. Rattay might want to chime in as well after 
Uh, and what we want to say, um, t piggybacking on to that last conversation uh, with the individual with chronic disease afraid to go out, it is important, even if you have a chronic disease or not, that all of us wear face coverings. Um, and, you know, certainly not our real little children and infants under two, but it really important and important as a health provider, you might've heard me if you tuned in earlier, talk about this being Nurses Week uh, and others. We wanna keep our health grade N95s and others for those who are providing care in our emergency rooms and our bedsides. They are also most vulnerable. Um, every day in this country, we are losing physicians, nurses, and other frontline health workers who have passed with the COVID. And it's really important whether a first line provider have those N95s. When you're wearing that protective face covering, Dr. Rite will share with you, we do that in public not so much for ourselves, but for others. We are doing that to prevent the spread of respiratory, the droplets onto surfaces where we may touch a handle on a grocery cart and then touch our face and our mouth. We wanna avoid that. And so having that mask is really important or the scarf or whatever handmade bandana that you're utilizing is for others. So again, uh, please know all of those measures are important, but the most important thing, again, to reiterate what Dr. Rite indicated is that social distancing until we can get a treatment or a vaccination. Uh, and to those persons who are lonely and stressed at home, we'll probably talk a little bit later about some other specific resources for you, but you are able to get in and out of a car and take a drive if you're alone, you can't be in a car full of other people, or there are some other measures, but everything we touch needs to have sanitizer, washing our hands, the Prell, really important. And those masks absolutely need to be for our first responders. We continue to see across this country where folks are saving them, uh, desanitizing them, taking them back to the hospital or to the nursing home. So again, please save those masks for our health providers. Dr. Rite, did I miss anything or do you think I got it all? No, no, you did great. The only thing I'll add is that um, um, I think something that, you know, we're constantly learning about this particular virus. And when this all started, I did not think we would be making a recommendation that everyone wear, wear face coverings. But the fact that that we now know how common asymptomatic spread is, is, is just so important because um, normally when you're sick and you're coughing and sneezing, that's how, you know, that's how you spread the infection. But what's clear now is that a lot of the spread of this infection is happening from people who have no clue that they have it. They don't have a cough. They're just talking and the droplets are coming out and, and, that's why these face masks or face coverings are so important for all of us. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor and Dr. Rite. A few questions here, <clears throat> Damien, about the interim steps that the state took this week to allow some small businesses to do additional business. Uh, can, we may have a slide here that details uh, some of those steps, but if, if not, could you could you say what what we did this week and the purpose of those interim steps? Sure. Yeah. And I see the slide is up. So there's really four major areas as you're thinking about these steps that uh, that we did take some some steps to to loosen some of the restrictions. Um, I want to say up front, it's still really important as we do this and moving into the phases as well. Um, I didn't mention this as we were talking about the timeline. We have to make sure as we do this that we're not relaxing some of the commitment. Uh, or, or the commitment we've had to safe social distancing and things like that. I know it's something Dr. Dr. Rite said, and, and jump in, Dr. Rite, if you if you'd like to take this. But it, I mean, she talked about flattening the curve, um, but not being out of the woods. As we start to move into these steps, what we don't want to do is move backwards, and it's going to require us to maintain the vigilance we've had. Um, so the first step, the first part of the this interim step, is allowing some retailers, and you'll see the list here. I won't go through it. Uh, completely to transact via curbside pickup uh, with the customer remaining in the car uh, and putting the items in the trunk or handing them off to them through, through a window. Um, staff has to maintain safe social distancing. Uh, the cars need to be a certain distance apart. There are guidelines around that um, was something that many small businesses had been asking us about um, and felt we could, we could move safely to allow this to occur um, for these types of stores. The second part is a switch. I like to call them uh, high ticket 
retailers. These are these are items that are typically purchased uh, purchases from these stores are are, are ranging in, in higher dial, dollar values. Um, we we did this for furniture stores a few weeks ago. Um, we've done it for automobile dealers. We're also now doing it for jewelry stores. That's stores that exclusively sell jewelry, um, and doing it for uh, actually also part of the order today was musical instrument stores uh, included on that, so they can transact by appointment only, uh, no more than two. Uh, appointments per half hour, um, which is the standard we use for other high ticket retailers. The third one uh, was the changes around uh, hair care services and cosmetology. Uh, so that is uh, allowing workers at essential businesses, um, and this follows the essential business list that, uh, that has been posted and that has, uh, has, been, uh, has become a part of our, our lives. Um, so workers at those businesses can now have hair care services performed um, there are strict restrictions on how those services can be performed. Uh, we've released guidelines. You can see the order. Uh, you can also see, see our guidelines, which mirror the order about what needs to be done uh, in order to take advantage of those, both from the service provider standpoint and from the customer standpoint to, to again, stay vigilant about preventing, uh, preventing spread. But uh, um, we are allowing that to occur up to two appointments at a time. Um, and then time in between the appointments to allow for cleaning and proper sanitation sanitization uh golf carts uh, are permitted to be offered again with up to one rider at a time and must be sanitized and then finally uh we're, we're allowing uh drive-in theaters and other similar services to occur um it's something that uh people the question we've gotten over the last uh, couple of days since this has been released is does that mean people who are already operating a drive-in theater and it's it's actually some folks have started to come uh, to us with plans to do drive-in theaters that didn't exist before in, in for instance, in open farmland uh, where cars can be uh, properly distance apart. Uh, and that's what we were moving to say can, can take place now. Um, there's further guidance on our website and, and, uh, and from uh, some other documents that explain exactly how that can happen. There has to be a certain distance between cars. Customers can't leave their cars while they're at the movie and things like that. So. Um, I'd encourage you to check that out, but but those are the major changes that were announced uh, this week. Thank you, Damien. And uh, I'm gonna uh, come back to you with a follow-up about farmers markets, but first, just for folks who are joining us, please do visit de.gov slash economy for details on Delaware's uh, reopening and recovery effort. <clears throat> and for the latest updates on coronavirus in Delaware, as always, visit de.gov slash coronavirus, which is maintained by Dr. Rattay's team over at the Division of Public Health have been doing an awesome job. So this follow-up uh, from Lauren Rusky in the comments is uh, for you, Damien. What is the reason behind the closing of farmers markets? I know we also got this yesterday. Lauren says small producers depend on these markets for their livelihood, and it provides many of us with an alternative to grocery stores. Can, so can you talk at all about farmers markets? Sure. So I know this is something that uh, that was that was done uh, in concert with uh, with Department of Agriculture. Um, I, I think there were a lot of concerns. Uh, initially, we did not shut them down completely, but there's been a lot of concerns over the last uh, couple of weeks that there were just large crowds there. They weren't being well controlled, um, and so that's that's why I, I think the step was taken to say that that for the time being they can't operate. And I think it, I, you know, it, I said. It, as we take these steps, we need to remain vigilant. I think that's that's a good example of if we're not able to do that, why we may have to, to tighten restrictions in some areas from time to time. Um, because again, I think throughout this process, public safety has been at the forefront. All right, thank you again. Uh, Dr. Rattay, back to you from Dan Ritter uh, in the comments who's worried that he is receiving mixed messages on masks. So he's asking, I think this is good to clarify for folks, are masks mandatory? or are they just uh, recommended for non-first responders? And, and to follow up on that, uh, how do you see masks, face coverings staying around even as we go into reopening phases here? Yeah, so the, this goes back to um, what we were just talking about, about asymptomatic spread being so common. So, I mean, it, it was a surprise, I think, to all of us that people without any symptoms may be um, the predominant way in which this infection is being spread. So the recommendation for face coverings, we don't say masks, but for face coverings 
is it is mandatory. I said, um, I just said recommendations. It's not a recommendation. It is, um, it is a requirement. If you are in public and specifically in places where social distancing is difficult, like a grocery store, um, like um, a, a pharmacy and you know, other places where it's difficult to social distance. Now, if you're walking the trail alone, that's fine. You don't, you don't need to, to wear one, but if you are within six feet of people, um, everyone needs to. And, and again, there's many, many different ways that, um, that these face coverings can be created. As Lieutenant Governor was saying, a lot of people are just using bandanas, which is fine. Um, I've found a number on uh, online that are comfortable. I just kind of wear them as a turtleneck and then I just, they, I put them up to cover my, my, um, my face, but it protects other people from you. It does provide some protection to you as the wearer, but it's especially important um, kind of that we're all doing our, our, our good deed, right? To prevent us from spreading infection to other people. And to answer the second part of that question, um, I, I don't know when that requirement will stop, but um, I think it's going to be with us for quite some time. I, I believe that wearing face coverings is going to just need to be part of our, of our new normal until the vaccine is widespread. Uh, that's a good segue into our into the next comment here from Earl, uh, who's asking, uh, will the state remain closed down until there's a vaccination? We've heard <clears throat> folks saying this in the comments. Obviously, we are moving forward with a reopening uh, before we see a vaccination. So can you talk about that? Wh what um, what might stick around and and what a vaccination ultimately would mean? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's a big reason why we are really ramping up our, our data and surveillance and our testing and our contact tracing so that we can really, really keep our finger on the pulse of, you know, how much infection is in the community, but also so we can do everything we can to keep the reproductive rate of this virus below one. Um, so we keep it, we keep it contained, right? But um, you know, until we have a, a vaccine, those are really, you know, uh, along with social distancing and face coverings, these are the best approaches we can that we have to prevent the the spread. So, with every step we take to lower the restrictions, we have to keep a really close eye on what does that do to the rate of infection. And if we start to see it, it driving up, just as Damien was saying, you know, we may have to go, we may have to go backwards a little, which none of us want to do at any point in time, but we're, we're going to need to keep a really close eye on what's the activity of this virus. Hopefully we'll, we'll um, get to keep, you know, opening more and more um, gradually. And if people are able to continue to, to social distance, we are going to be much more effective. So if we can all, you know, take responsibility to not be in crowds and to, um, you know, not congregate in unsafe ways, um, we're, we're going to be able to be much more successful in reopening. Thank you, Dr. Ate. Uh, Kim in the comments, Damien, for you. Uh, it sounds like Kim works at a hair salon. And she has a very specific question. Uh, Kim says, if it's one client for each stylist with no more uh, people than four at the location, can a receptionist be there or administrative staff? Have you heard a lot of these questions? And generally, where can people go to get these kind of specific questions answered? Uh, yeah. You know? um, so we have an FAQ document up that addresses many of these questions. I, I direct people to those for, for some of the more intricate details related to this order, specifically for the 15th update that, that pertains to the interim steps we talked about. Um, go to our website, uh, business.delaware.gov slash coronavirus, uh, where, we, where we post that guidance. And there's some information around uh, staffing um, and things like that related to this order. Thank you, Damien. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go right back to you, Dr. Rate, um, about contact tracing. We got a couple of questions about contact tracing after you mentioned it. Can you just explain what contact tracing is and why it's important as we move forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, contact tracing is core public health, as my um, 
public health professor, uh, Lieutenant <laughs> Governor Hall Long knows. Um, and, and contact tracing has been a part of uh, public health for you know centuries. Um, when you diagnose somebody with a contagious infection, of course, you want that person to be isolated and separated from other individuals. Um, but you also want the people that they've been in contact with who have risk of developing the infection to also be aware that they may be developing the infection and oftentimes quarantines, which is, which is the case here. So we do this with, with tuberculosis as an example. Um, when somebody has a, an infectious form of tuberculosis, we find out who all their contacts are and we contact them and we test them and, and we give them treatment. Well, since we don't have treatment here, that our approach to making sure that they're quarantined during the time period of incubation, which is approximately 14 days, um, is gonna help to eliminate them from unknowingly spreading it to somebody else. So contact tracing is, and especially in this situation right now, is a really critically important public health tool um, for us to use to, um, uh, to really decrease the spread. That's great. Jonathan, I will add um, to what Dr. Rite indicated, um, knowing um, the members of our legislature and other local officials who joined in, uh, they have had uh, great experiences over the past couple of years, um, some of them with our behavioral health consortium that's worked with community health workers. And as we go forward with contact tracing, I know our leader, Dr. Rite, along with um, the governor's office and others will finalize plans. They don't have those directly in place yet. However, I know all of us have been contacted by individuals with um, background or interest in assisting with contact tracing. And I know that through the consortium and others, we have bilingual and other uh, community health workers uh, who will probably step up. But this is an area I know that the Division of Public Health, when the time is right, will also be answering some of your questions and comments because we do know that a number of you have contacted uh, members of the General Assembly and our, and our offices about this. And so again, Dr. Rite, I know you'll probably have more about that probably in the next uh, few weeks, right? Um, actually, um, early next week. Okay. So we'll, we'll be able to announce this publicly, but I'm glad that you just, um, you just triggered something really important. We know that there's a lot of people out there interested in contact tracing, especially in becoming contact tracers. And um, we want to make sure that if people are interested in becoming a contact tracer, that they send an email to dphcontacttracing at delaware.gov. Great. Thank you. We'll be sure we can put that in the box. And again, before we go to Jonathan, we'll remind individuals we may not get to every question tonight. We're trying our best before the seven o'clock hour. But please um, submit questions, comments, thoughts, ideas to de.gov forward slash economy. So back to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. And I'll just amplify that. We will put that email, DPH contact tracing at Delaware.gov in the comments for anyone who is interested, uh, obviously, in, in helping out there. I know this, is, this one uh, hits close to home, Damien, for you, but a uh, question about uh, summer camp programs and child care. How are we, uh, how's the state of Delaware thinking about child care? How do people, how can people go back to work if we, uh, if we don't have access to child care? What, what are our thoughts there? Yeah, it's absolutely uh, critically important. Um, we think about it in, in perfect concert with anything we're doing in terms of the, the interim steps we're taking, in terms of any phase one reopening. Uh, folks who are called back to work as a result of any of those steps uh, will need child care options. Um, and we want to make sure that those are available to them. So I know folks in our Office of Child Care Licensing are working with providers uh, to make sure they're prepared to to receive more children. Um, when we announced this order today, uh, when we announced this order earlier this week, part of the order was allowing uh, an expansion of the, the restrictions that are in place around who can access child care services to make sure that anyone called back to work as a result of these changes could access them. Um, we'll continue to do that as we take uh, took further steps and as we moved into the, the phase one and, and phase two. Um, on the issue of summer camps, that is a, a bit different than uh, child care. Uh, the CDC guidance recommends uh, considering them in the phase two reopening. 
Um, but I think it's important to underscore that when the CDC guidance recommends a reopening of an industry, whether it's phase one, phase two, phase three, that doesn't just mean it reopens and, and goes back to normal. So uh, summer camps, just like uh, restaurants, just like uh, other businesses, the arts, theaters, uh, there are things where we're working directly with some folks in those industries right now to develop guidelines um, because we want to make sure that when they do open in those phases, they do so safely uh, and do so in a way that I think consumers can be confident in it is safe as well. So, and Can you talk about that just briefly about consumer confidence and public acceptance of this and how we navigate that? We've heard that on our small business calls and are, are folks concerned? Are you concerned? How do we uh, how do we make people confident to go back out and about, shop, go to restaurants, et cetera? Well, I, I think, yeah, I think it's certainly something we're hearing. It's a fear of business owners. Um, I think we hear it from the general public too. Um, and I think it's critically, that's why it's critically important uh, that we that we execute the, the, the game plan that I think Governor Carney has laid out for working with particular industries. Uh, a lot of those industries are areas where you do see large groups of consumers gathering, like consumer facing retail, restaurants, uh, theaters, uh, tourism industry items um, to really come up with specific plans, not just for the business so that they understand what they need to do to be able to reopen, um, but so that consumers can feel good about the reopening under the guidelines that are put forward. So we're working uh, in concert with industry. We're also working very closely with public health officials uh, led by Dr. Rate as we come up with those guidelines uh, to make sure what we're putting forward is something that that members of the public, what Governor Carney ultimately put forward is something that members of the public can feel confident in. Thank you, Damien. And I'm going to give you this question, Lieutenant Governor, straightforward but difficult question. Uh, everybody wants to go back to the beaches. Kim Bartholomew and and says, will our beaches open this summer? Any thoughts? And maybe we'll get a, a take from Dr. Rattay as well. Yes. Um, you know, what I will say uh, for those who uh, know, know me and have uh, been around with us in the last few weeks, this has been a very important conversation. And for me personally, having been born and raised in a beach area, but also to one who's involved as is Dr. Rattay and our governor and others into healthy lifestyles and keeping one um, physically fit and mentally sound. Our governor had the uh, foresight, I say, to keep our beaches open for one-on-one -on -one socially isolated activity. So you could still walk your dog, you could still go on a jog, uh, you could still uh, surf fish. These are activities that I have found in my conversations and I'm sure others who are online tonight have appreciated. I know that our governor today had a meeting. I don't know the outcome because it was later on uh, with the mayors of our local beach towns uh, for those who are talking in Sussex. We know that the beaches also run our entire coastline. So whether you're in Bowers Beach in Kent County or you're up here uh, in Wilmington where I'm sharing my message with you tonight along the riverfront, uh, our waterway is very important. And so I know that in the near future, we'll probably be hearing some more updates on the beach. What is so critical and why the beaches had to close, we were not social distancing. People were not at that time, they were crowding upon one another and it just was not safe and the right decision to protect individuals was put in place. And the final thing I'll say uh, before if Dr. Rattay has anything to add, our governor uh, has been part of the regional area, uh, which has included certainly New Jersey um, in a pact between New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and others. But also he's been in frequent conversation with our sister state to our south and west, which is Maryland. Obviously what happens in the beaches in Ocean City affects our coastline. And I know conversations have been in place there because again, we want to have uniformity and safe measures in place. So again, I uh, encourage those of you who are at the beach communities to individually go out for a walk. More direction I know will be coming in the upcoming weeks as you look at the beach season and rentals. Dr. Rattay, do you have other items to add to that? I, I think you summarized that great. I think the, the only thing I'll add is kind of um, hearing the governor's voice and how um, you know, I think he, he felt he needed to react when he saw um, in March, a nice March day when people were supposed to be social distanced and, and uh, looked, looked out at the beach and saw just like clusters of people close together. And, as, you know, similarly, 
um, with the weekend before with, with at the bars um, when there was supposed to be a limit to the number of people in the bars and, um, and that didn't happen. And I, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is how successful we are as we kind of slowly reopen beaches and bars and, you know, other, um, you know, other entities, locations across the state is, is how well can we as, you know, Delawareans maintain social distancing? How well can we, you know, do what we need to do to prevent, prevent the spread? And it's hard. Um, but uh, that's, I know what, what we're all going to have to keep our eyes open for. Well, for you, Dr. Rate, about the, the measurements around uh, social distancing and what data we're looking at. And I'll just do a, a real quick PSA for uh, folks to look at the latest data. You can visit de.gov slash healthy community. You can also get there from the de.gov slash coronavirus page. Sarah Jean asks, are, are we looking at number of new cases or hospitalizations? I know we're looking at all of the above, but uh, Dr. Rattay, can you talk about the importance of data and, and what you're looking at? Yeah, da data are incredibly important to us. And um, you know, we've had a lot of lengthy conversations with our colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and across states. And this is something that the governor has put a tremendous amount of thought into. And um, there's no one measure that is going to tell us the picture of what is, what is going on. Um, and some measures give you an earlier signal of, of activity. Other measures like death give you uh, later or later or lagging indicators. And so we really are looking at a set of indicators to help us better understand the, the, the trends. Um, positive cases is a, um, is a really important one and will be very important as we go forward forward um, to help us know if we've contained and kept the, the infection contained. Uh, we were very concerned about this one, knowing that we're dealing with a hotspot in Sussex and we're really ramping up testing, um, that we would see um, that it wouldn't be a true reflection um, of, of the virus in the state, but, but we are seeing decreases in um, uh, positive cases. So um, new cases, new cases. Um, we also are looking at percent positive cases, which isn't as um, dependent upon how many tests you do. Um, in fact, there are um, there's one report that says we shouldn't open until we're below 10% of uh, positive cases, uh, which means not only are we doing a lot of testing, but that we have very little, um, very little virus. Um, right now, I think we're around 20%. Um, we were up at, as high as 32% at one point. So that's an important indicator. Hospitalizations and new hospitalizations are two really important indicators because that's not dependent on testing. That's really, you know, how many sick people, um, really sick people do we have um, in the state? So we're uh, keeping a very close eye on that as well as one that we call COVID-like illness, which just helps us see, you know, how much, um, how much of um, symptoms are we seeing? How many people with symptoms are we seeing in our emergency departments? And uh, so it's that whole set. And as, um, as Jonathan was saying, um, best place to go is de.gov backslash coronavirus now, and just click on um, healthy communities from there. And there's a, a lot of data that you can take a look at. You'll see our dashboard, but you'll also um, see, and I think it's important to add, um, we're also looking at important indicators like, do we have enough face masks? Do we have enough gowns? Right now we actually don't have enough surgical gowns to get us very far. Um, and so that's that's important. And we also need to make sure we have adequate amounts of, of testing and uh, contact tracing in, a, in our state. So again, no one indicator. We're looking at all of this comprehensively. Well, thank you, Dr. Rate. Back to Damien. I know you've heard this before, Damien, but uh, Tim Conkus in the, in the Facebook comments says, sole proprietor retail stores need to be open immediately. Sole proprietor businesses don't have any government lifelines, and now it's Mother's Day weekend. It's critical that they be open, uh, Tim says. Can you talk about sole proprietor retail shops and how they're uh, uh, involved in any way? In sure. Yeah, no, I 
definitely understand Tim's concern. Um, I think that's why uh, Governor Carney moved to uh, take the interim steps we have to permit curbside delivery. Um, we know it's not going to be something that that solves all of the problems, but it was something that we heard from from the small business community uh, in particular that it would be helpful to help them recover some lost revenue. Um, I think we're going to continue to work uh, with the small business community uh, to identify other opportunities to do things like that uh, that can be done safely and can, again, help them recover some of their lost revenue. Um, we're also from the division. Uh, this is this is a, a bit more. It sounds like it's on the fun side, but it really is something that we feel like can be helpful to these small businesses. Um, we're doing weekly uh, uh, shop local Delaware contests on, on our Facebook page where folks can, uh, if they shop at a small local retailer in Delaware, uh, can post a picture of the item they purchased where they had it delivered to their house, now can do curbside pickup uh, to get their item. If they post it online with one of our frames, they could be entered to win a gift card from our office. So we're trying to encourage people uh, to get out there um, to shop under the guidelines uh, locally um, and, and having a little bit of fun and giving out a reward to try to get people to, to increase uh, the rate of doing it. And if you put it on your Facebook, it helps spread the word to others how they might be able to uh, to enjoy local small businesses right now. So um, those are some of the things we're doing to try to help right now. Um, we know it's not helping recover all the lost revenue, but I, but I think uh, every little bit, it helps. Thanks, Damian. A couple more science questions for you, Dr. Rattay, uh, and maybe Lieutenant Governor can help you. We have one from Sandra Biller uh, from Millsboro, comments who says, and we heard this early on, <clears throat> this question, her question now is, does the warm weather help make the virus go away? Is there any evidence there? Any thoughts from you, Dr. Rete? We don't know. <laughs> I wish I had, I wish I could say yes, but we don't know. Um, so we will, we will all be learning together if, uh, if it makes a difference. It's a new virus and uh, when it is warmer, people have a tendency to spend more time outside However, uh, again, in these circumstances, you're going to still need the face cover um, unless you're walking alone or doing a jog alone or walking your dog um, safely. And uh, we do know that uh, we don't have the data on the, uh, the, the, all the particulars around the virus, but uh, we do encourage individuals until we know more uh, to really practice those social distancing and hand washing and all the things to prevent uh, community spread. Jonathan, what's your next question? Thank you. I have one from Donna, uh, again, maybe for you both, about nursing homes, long-term care facilities. Donna thinks we should make nursing homes an even greater priority. Dr. Tay, can you talk about uh, the risk, particularly in nursing homes of COVID-19? And, and this week, uh, Governor Carney and the Division of Public Health announced a universal testing program for staff and residents in, in long-term care facilities and, and maybe talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, um, so congregate settings are a challenge in general. Um, I, what has um, made nursing homes or long-term care facilities, I think um, just um, it's been so devastating for individuals in these settings is these are the highest risk individuals for negative consequences from this virus. So for example, when we had H1N1 11 years ago around, um, it was infecting more you know, younger people. So it didn't affect um, the, the nursing homes or long-term care facilities the way COVID-19 has. It is very difficult to prevent the spread of this infection if, um, if precautions, all the right precautions aren't made. And I think we, we learned that um, pretty early on that asymptomatic staff or you know people who didn't have symptoms might be bringing the virus in unknowingly, of course, and, um, and exposing other individuals. And then it just, it can be a real challenge then to decrease the spread. We have been doing a tremendous amount of work to help provide support to long-term care facilities, a lot of education and technical assistance. We actually have a, a team on the ground here, a team of nurses. Um, uh, it's a federal asset called DMAT, 
who is here working with our long-term care facilities and other congregate settings across the state to help make sure that um, that they all are really well educated on how to use personal protective equipment. You know, nurses and doctors in hospitals, they use PPE all the time and they're very used to it. They know how to not infect themselves and, and, and to use it effectively, but there's uh, needed to be a lot of training in, in long-term care to make sure that it is, um, uh, that it is used effectively and in a way that doesn't, um, it doesn't actually put people at risk. So again, a lot of training and technical assistance. We are now doing universal testing with long-term care facilities a- across the state so that we can better help them identify who has the infection and who doesn't so that you know we can separate people depending on whether they have the infection and we can also separate staff so they're not crossing over from one group of people to another. I think that's great, um, Dr. Rite. I know, gosh, the time goes so quickly when we're having the um, input from the community and answering questions. Please continue to give us your feedback at de.gov forward slash economy. We're rounding out our last 10 minutes or so of the conversation. And the only thing I would add is um, as you uh, consider the nursing home and the long-term care and skilled facilities, um, I know in the Southern portion of Newcastle County, there are a number of such care settings and providers that if you have questions or need, or need some assistance, you know, you can dial our 211 line uh, where they can also connect you to uh, additional staff at the call center at public health or other resources uh, that you might need. Or if you have a loved one who's been recently discharged from a long-term care setting to your home and have information that you need or assistance with, please remember our 211 number. Uh, Jonathan, back to you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I'm, and I'm going to kick this one right to you. This is a tough question, but uh, uh, Nikki in the Facebook comments is, is very persistent and wants us to address uh, uh, the government overstep and overreach and is concerned that government has gone too far with some of these restrictions. We see that a lot in, in our uh, social media comment sections. Can you just talk about the purpose of these restrictions and, and what you would say to folks who have concerns about government going too far? Absolutely. And I uh, certainly understand that. I know Dr. Rate will um, probably comment. I know Damien and all of us, um, you know, every day feel the, you know, feel the pain and the concern. Uh, this is something we've not experienced in our lifetime. I had a great grandmother who lived through as a teenager, the pandemic, the Spanish flu in Philadelphia, and vividly recall the stories of similarities of what we are experiencing now. There was not a treatment, there was not a vaccination. The difference is today, we have a much more sophisticated health system that has allowed us a little length of survivorship. I will share with you that it is government's mission to work in tandem with our chamber, with our partners, to those listening, both our elected officials and others, to put forth safety as our number one mission. And so I know as Dr. Rite, the head of public health, A.J. Shaw, our Director of Emergency Management, will share with you that all of us have put forth uh, the best plan to continue to keep Delawareans safe. And that safety measure is the first test of any government. I do know that I'm confident that with your guidelines and as our Dr. Rite and others put in place, we do want to safely open. I know our governor has said he doesn't want to keep the state closed any day longer than he has to, but he also doesn't want to jeopardize uh, our well-being and our lives. And so we know from history, we don't want to repeat that. We saw in Philadelphia a century ago what happened uh, when there were lots of protests and issues occurring on the street. We had more death when people didn't continue with their protective measures. And I think our CDC and others are genuinely looking for that balance. And so I say to others who have expressed this concern, we hear you. We're working with you and we want to keep all of us safe. Dr. Rite, I don't know if you have anything that you would like to add to that comment. Yeah, I mean, I get it too. I get it why um, why people feel that way. And especially at this point, I think people are are getting antsy and, and tired of being of feeling re- restrained. You know, I think um, we're not doing it for our, ourselves in many ways. We're doing it for others. And um with that perspective, you know, thinking about that we're doing it for our first responders, we're doing it for our grandparents, we're doing it for nurses and doctors who are on the front lines. Um, we're doing it to, to save lives. And um, 
Um, it, it, but it's, it's hard. I know that it's hard for people to feel like their, their rights, um, are, are being removed from them to, to do whatever they want. And, uh, and I just, I so appreciate that Delawareans have done such an amazing job social distancing over, over the past almost seven weeks. Thank you, Dr. Tay. And, and another, uh, one more question for you, uh, just about testing for folks who have joined us. We've got some uh, questions uh, pre-submitted and in both sets of comments here about testing. Can you just talk again about the importance of testing and, and any testing that will be prioritized as we look toward reopening? Why is testing such a big deal? Why do we need to expand testing statewide? Yeah, um, and, and I think it's important to really mention that um, we are evolving and what you're hearing from me now and, you know, over the upcoming weeks and months is different than where we were, you know, when this all started and we had almost no tests in the state and we were only testing people with symptoms. Um, now we know so much more. We know that many people without symptoms are, are spreading the infection. So you're going to hear a lot more from us and you're going to see a lot more opportunities, especially for um, individuals in, in risk groups, essential employees, um, and people who have been direct contacts with, with positive cases, um, to have testing op opportunities, uh, to know, you know, if they have had the, inf if they have the infection or not, why this is so important again, is we're, we're trying to keep this, maybe you've heard this R not, or this reproductive rate of, of the virus, but if we can keep it below one by ca catching people who have the infection and keeping them isolated and catching their uh, direct contacts and keeping them quarantined, we're going to better be able to uh, decrease the spread and, and live more of, of, of normal lives. So testing is, is really critical as we enter these reopening phases with less, um, less restrictions. Thank you. And um, again, just before we wrap up here, I, I want to do another quick PSA. Go to de.gov slash economy to learn more about Delaware's reopening and uh, recovery effort. Uh, a lot of that is being led by Damien and his team at the Division of Small Business. For the latest updates on coronavirus in Delaware, you can visit de.gov slash coronavirus. That includes a link to the My Healthy Community data that, um, that Dr. Rattay and her team put together. So, so please take a look at that data. And thank you again for tuning in to all these town halls that we've had. I will go now to Lieutenant Governor Hall Long for closing remarks. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you so much to everyone who's participated in this evening. A special thank you to Dr. Rattay and Damien and uh, our favorite interpreter who always uh, makes sure all Delawareans are able to uh, participate. Uh, please do visit de.gov forward slash economy. Give us your feedback. And to Nikki and the others, uh, trust us. We feel the frustration. We're working hard every day to make sure that we adapt those best models uh, that are put in practice. Uh, we know we have a lot of businesses who are in the essential services now who've been joined to this evening actually by members of our cabinet and our secretaries who've been listening in who've been working in the front lines with those of you in transportation and also in other economic avenues in our state uh, with members of the General Assembly and our municipal leaders. We are listening. I know every time our governor comes forward, he brings forth uh, executive orders that are based upon data. Data will determine dates. We are working with our neighboring uh, states. We're uh, having a resource site tonight. I wanna make sure that does get shared. Um, Damien will tell you if you contact his office or others visiting the Division of Public Health. Uh, you will also see that with AJ Shaw and others team, we have PPE and others, a link that will be coming forward uh, if you visit de.gov forward slash coronavirus. You'll see those resources, but pretty soon for those of you who perhaps in business are questioning about PPE or hygiene products, we'll have that there for you. So a lot of resources. And the final thing I will say as we round out uh, the hour this evening, uh, please know that uh, your stress uh, that you feel, that your employees feel, we have also resources through telehealth and various services by dialing 211. 
uh, help is here, uh, Dello at DE. Uh, we want you to visit these sites. Know that we are here to support you. We have unfortunately seen an uptick in emotional distress and elders with social isolation. And so again, being supportive of our nonprofits, being supportive of all of you in the chamber and all, we want to show that we can, as Delawareans, work together to make this difference. And again, on behalf of Governor Carney's team, all the other electeds, I wanna say thank you so much for the feedback be safe, be well, look forward to continuing our dialogue. Thank you so much.